Hey folks, before we kick into exploring the high low country, we have some exciting news. Brian, want to tell them? Yes, uh, we got to be guests on the Pure Cinema podcast, their Patreon episode this week. Uh, and we have a great discussion about movies that they think the world is wrong about. And they picked a few favorites from some of the episodes we've done in the past. Yeah, yeah. Brian and Elric, the hosts of the Pure Cinema podcast, shows The Hunter and One Trick Pony from our list of films and that they that they think the world is wrong about and they also picked a couple of films that they think the world is wrong about two of your favorites <laughs> u-turn and take me home tonight i'm actually a huge u-turn fan i'm glad they picked it yeah it uh, was a blast was i love those guys they were one of the big inspirations for wanting to do a film podcast like this and yeah. i hope this is the first of many collaborations because they're great and we entirely we really encourage you please go out and subscribe to their podcast it's great they just had quentin tarantino on as a guest he's he's a pretty cool director we like him yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. They, they work with the new beverly cinema which is one of yeah. my favorite theaters they're just, yeah. they're great and if you want to hear our episode uh it's on their patreon channel so just get, go and support them you know we don't have a patreon channel so if you're thinking of subscribing to ours, go and subscribe to theirs. They're, they're great. There you go. <laughs> and I'll provide a link in the show notes. Also, I will provide a link to this week's movie, The High Low Country, which is not available streaming anywhere. So I am once again risking prosecution to bring cinema to you. <laughs> and as soon as, it, as soon as they start streaming that film someplace, I'll take it down. I don't want to be breaking the law, but I also want you to get a chance to see this film. And speaking of seeing films, I'm, I'm talking to you, Brian, from your new job at a movie theater. Where, where, where am I speaking to you right now? Uh, it, I work at the IPIC Theater in uh, the Domain. And, uh, you know, if you want to see Conjuring 3, or, uh, you know, Wrath of Man or whatever. Yeah, what, it changes every week. By the time you hear this tomorrow, it's going to be something different. What's so. going to be playing tomorrow? We're actually closed tomorrow. Oh, oh no, wait. We're clo no, wait. Tomorrow's Wednesday. I'm confused. We're pretending today's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Oh, Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Sounds like a great film. Uh, yeah, we're big Samuel Jackson fans here, so come out and support them. Anyway, let's get to the show, folks. <laughs> thanks for tuning in again and again. Uh, thanks to every to those guys at the Pure Cinema Podcast. We love them. Radio Eight Ball. Andros here. When I'm not co-hosting the World Is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. I'm Larry Bishop, and you're listening to The World is Wrong Podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about the high low country, country. <laughs> and welcome to the world is wrong an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about i am one of your hosts and my name is andras jones i'm also a host and my name is brian Connolly. you're not just a host you're a host of this show hey that's right <laughs> yeah here i am <laughs> <laughs> and we are here to talk about the film The High Low Country and its director, Stephen Frears. And we'll get into playing a clip and I'll tell you about the film. But before we do, do you want to just give a quick take on why you're excited about Stephen Frears? Because we've talked about him in previous episodes. <laughs> he is a director that I really love uh, a lot. And he, it's like, in a way, he's sort of like the good Ron Howard. We're like... 
And on, on, on the surface, it seems like Stephen Frears is a director for hire. He doesn't write a lot of his scripts. He is very genre hopping all over the place. But then when you kind of get into the world of Stephen Frears, you realize that there is a consistency between his work. There is there is a vision. And more and most importantly, he's just really, really fucking good at his job. Like, he is not just a gun for hire. Like, he really, I feel, is like a true great filmmaker. He would have fit in in like the fifties, like as those great filmmakers that were kind of working in the studio system, putting their stamp on things that they had nothing to do with initially. And I think he's one of those great directors, like much like Michael Apted, when we talked about Michael Apted many episodes ago for uh, Thunderheart and Incident at Oglala. I think that uh, he is just a great, hardworking man who makes constant things of high quality with high quality performances. And I did a very deep dive on Stephen Frears for this episode. So we'll be going through his, through most of his filmography in a sort of a brief overview uh, as we, uh, as we explore Stephen Frears and one of my favorites of his films, the film, The High Low. I'm tired of you looking worried all the time. You're my friend and I am worried. Yeah, well, I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm doing at all times. I know what I'm doing being with her. See, Pete, I am one some bitch who can judge women. Not many men can. Lots of them can judge horses. A man that knows horses don't really need to look at their teeth. He can just tell that an old pony with holes above his eyes, a drooping lower lip, and a sunken butthole is past to go get him stage but it takes a master to tell if a horse has got bottom some of the best conformed horses in the world ain't got bottom they will let you down when you get in that old bind but now a fella can't go around looking to see if a woman has got knobby knees or a sunken butthole in a canny <laughs> he got to be able to sense it a good woman is like a good horse. She's got bottom. What old sorrel's got? Now, that old horse will go day and night when the wind is trying to tear your head off and when a wild cow cuts back through the brush, old sorrel's right there running, turning, working his heart out for you. But now, Mona, this Mona that everybody's so damn interested in, <laughs> she is a beautiful woman. That ain't all. She's got a bottom. And she's gonna make me a partner to go along with old Sorrel. And there ain't no backstabbing, gossiping bunch of yellow belly chicken shits gonna stop me. Carry the message, you bastards. The High Low Country is a Western noir melodrama from Stephen Frears, working way out of his English element and, in my opinion, killing it with a cast led by Billy Crudup, Woody Harrelson, and Patricia Arquette. It's a gorgeously shot film that owes a great debt to George Stevens' giant, as much as to the Technicolor 1950s films of Douglas Sirk, Nicholas Ray, and Ilya Kazan. And since it was produced by Martin Scorsese, we can be fairly confident all of these touchstones are, to some degree, intentional. There was a moment when Billy Crudup was on the verge of a sort of next James Dean level movie stardom with films like Everyone Says I Love You, Inventing the Abbots, Without Limits, Jesus' Son, Waking the Dead, and this Lost Gem. All of these characters are some pretty flawed men, so maybe that explains his stardom peaking with 
almost famous, playing another morally ambiguous man. We want charming simplicity from our stars. Crudup's career suggests that great and complex acting is at odds with international leading man stardom. It's also why he has remained an interesting character actor, particularly recently in his role in The Morning Show with Reese Witherspoon and Jennifer Aniston. All of this is to say that this film is built around Billy Crudup, and it lives and dies depending on your level of affinity for him. It is through his eyes and his voiceover that we experience the story of big boy Matson, played by Woody Harrelson as a real cowboy, one of the last born of outlaws and the women who survived them. His character reminds me of Kirk Douglas in Lonely Are the Brave, someone who revels in all aspects of cowboy and even as such a thing ceases to exist. This film begins with the coming of World War II. Big Boy and Crudup's Pete Calder join up while Big Boy's little brother, Little Boy, played by Cole Hauser, stays behind to work for Sam Elliott, playing a mustacheless heavy, profiting off the wartime rise in beef prices. This sets up the conflict when our heroes return home after the war to find their hometown under the economic thumb of Sam Elliott and his henchmen, including character actor John Deal, who is married to Mona, played by Patricia Arquette. This is peak Patricia, drawing our sympathy to a character who could be pretty frustrating if she weren't wrapped in whatever dreamy haze animated so many of Arquette's best performances of that era. Lost Highway, Flirting with Disaster... Ed Wood. Her husband doesn't even figure into the love triangle between the three leads, and I was happy that Frears doesn't lean into the jealousy. In fact, the complications he lays before his characters are much more deeply complicated than that. Crudup's pining for Mona and his love for Big Boy aside, the young woman who truly loves Pete is... Penelope Cruz in her first big American feature, and his ill treatment of her really makes Pete, and perhaps the actor portraying him, a hard guy to like. Perhaps another actress, one who did not exude such an open-heartedness of face, might mitigate this cruelty, but international movie stars don't abuse the affections of Penelope Cruz like this, nor do they rape Patricia Arquette or look so longingly at Woody Harrelson. I do think this is one of Crudup's greatest roles, but it's the opposite of a star-making performance. At least that's how it turned out. This kind of honest portrayal of the cruelty and frailty of sympathetic men is what gives this film its Frearsian slant. That and the genuine interest it has for the female characters, even in a film which is so much about the men and their drinking and fighting and cowboying to their inevitable tragic end. I think it's no accident that the big Western star who makes an appearance in the High Low Country is Katie Gerardo, who appeared in films like High Noon, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, and most importantly, Marlon Brando's Freudian 50s western, One-Eyed Jacks, which we can discuss in terms of its influence on this film. And that is the High Low Country. Hello, my son. Howdy. Sit down. You want the card or the crystal? The crystal? Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. So, what do you wish to know? I want to know if all of us who are here tonight will be alive and prosperous next year. No. Good job. <laughs> um, 
It's interesting because it's this is a movie that was originally going to be made by Sam Peckinpah, and that would have been a much different movie. I feel he would have sympathized much more with the bad behavior <laughs> than Stephen Frears does. <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> like, about that. Yeah, yeah, because the screenwriter of of this movie, who is an interesting person in his own right, um, what what Wallen Waylon Waylon Green, he wrote the Wild Bunch. And I guess this was this novel was something that Peck and Paul was gonna was trying to do back in the '60s. Like he wanted to make this into a movie, and it just couldn't get it together. And he was and he really loved Max Evans, the guy who wrote the novel. And Max Evans even has a bit part in the Ballad of Cable Hogue, a a, a very good uh, another whimsical sort of western, not quite a western sort of thing. Um, would have been a much different movie. It would have been interesting to see this as sort of that kind of last hurrah of Hollywood 60s Western. And it definitely would have been, I think, more misogynistic just because of it being Sam Peckinpah. Definitely. <laughs> like he would have yeah. been like more into like, I do all the things these guys do. These guys are great. Yeah. So I think it's good. It's, I think it's, it's always interesting uh, and it rarely happens when a person from another country makes a very American movie in in a way like of a, of like a western, I mean, or like a gangster movie or whatever, and so having the fact the fact that a person from the cross the seas is making a western, that's going to make it very different than someone you know from Texas making a western or whatever. Um, and I believe this it was the first time I've seen Sam Elliott without a mustache. And it was frankly shocking. I was shocked. <laughs> that was <laughs> troubling. It's troubling. Troubling. I mean, plenty of other people have big bushy mustaches of the Sam Elliott variety in this movie. But I mean, maybe that's how we know that Sam Elliott's uh, villain is that he doesn't have a mustache. And you're like, I don't trust this mustacheless man in the West. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another another resonance between One Eyed Jacks and High Low Country because One Eyed Jacks was supposed to be directed by Stanley Kubrick, oh, and ended up being directed by Marlon Brando. Hmm. So, do you want to know how the world is wrong about this film? I really do. Tell me. Well, first of all, 1998 when it came out was a pretty great year for movies. We got The Truman Show. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, The Big Lebowski, The Thin Red Line, Out of Sight, Rushmore. Those are some of the big wow. ones for me that were just wow. sort of like 1998. Everyone talks about 1999, but 1998 was better. Good. It's better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I get all the reasons this film didn't register with audiences at the time. If you were a fan of Stephen Frears, it's a pretty big departure, uh, and he was also coming off the failure of Hero, uh, or Accidental Hero, as it was known in the UK, so it had that going against it. And then people who were expecting some kind of hunky Legends of the Fall type film <laughs> got something a lot darker and a lot more classical yeah. cinematically. And then the film nerds who would have got what Frears is doing were probably turned off by that hunky Legend of the Fall vibe that the poster <laughs> gives off and makes it look like it's just a boring romance movie with hot guys in it. Uh, of course, none of that should matter now. At this point, I think the only reason the world is wrong about this film is because it isn't available. And uh, my hope is that our talk and our talking about it can do something about that so yeah so it's like not on any streaming platforms at all like it it's uh it, it was put out on dvd i think like a long time ago but not blu-ray i don't think and yeah like this was a hard movie to find i like thought i found one then i didn't then i had you have to give me your copy and you know movies movies shouldn't be this hard to get they shouldn't be it's not like the mona lisa hanging on a museum wall like we have the right to see every movie ever made whenever we want god damn it well I just want to I just want to point out that uh, it, it's it's a little bit in the rear view in terms of time because when this comes out. But this week we just found out that Mad Dog Time got picked up by Tubi. And there you go. I got to think that that's because of definitely, us. definitely. No one's been talking about this movie. No, there must be some algorithm that was like, wow, there's some heat around Mad Dog Time. So 
Let's do that with Hilo Country, folks. Let's <laughs> let's let's make somebody out there feel that, like they can grab some cash by. That's why we do there. this. We we do this to make these movies like so people will notice them and watch them and maybe make them. You know, who doesn't want a crazy four disc Criterion edition of Mad Dog Time? Like they don't even know they don't want like they they want it, but they want it. Everyone wants that. <laughs> so Hilo Country, same thing. Like Criterion's put some freers out. They put the hit out. So like. Let's 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 do it, people. Um. When you say they put the hit out, it sounds like they put like they're <laughs> they put they're the hit out on Stephen Frears. No, the movie, the hit. Um, <laughs> well, I guess that's a good place. Maybe shall we do a little uh, tour through well, the films of Stephen Frears? Actually, let's build up to that because I am curious to get your take on this film, The High yeah. Low Country. First off, <laughs> well, it's interesting. <laughs> Because I kind of feel like I'm part of the world that's wrong because I, before I watched it, I, it was, I was very built up to me of like, oh, I can't, I love Stephen Frears. I yeah. cannot wait. I'm sorry about and, that. I built well, not, it up this is not just from you, just from me and my, cause like, we, like really, like I only recently have gotten into Stephen Frears, like, like in the last year, I've just been kind of like eating it up. Like during the, the lockdown, I've just been watching every Stephen Frears within my grasp, like TV and movies. And so I was like, oh, I haven't seen that one. This is very exciting. And I literally had just watched a Stephen Furs movie like a week ago, two weeks ago. So I was just like ready, ready, ready. And before I do uh, before I do our show, usually I'll read a bunch of the reviews so I kind of can go in fighting. Being like, oh, I'll show you, Roger, but I did, I'm going to disagree with you on this one. And I read his review and I read like Leonard Maltin's review and I read a few of them. And then after the movie was done, I kind of was like, oh, shit, I kind of agree with those guys. Like I... So I'm part of the problem because <laughs> like I basically what the review said and kind of how I felt was I felt a little lukewarm after it. I kind of maybe I, I don't know what I was expecting. I definitely wasn't expecting some big sweeping epic, but I think emotionally I just couldn't for whatever reason connect to anything that was going on in this movie. I think partially because Billy Crudup doesn't say a lot. And the narration to me is kind of infrequent in the movie. It kind of comes and goes in weird parts. And so like, I kind of left feeling like, huh, that was a movie. I don't really know how I feel about it. Cause it kind of seems like things happened and may, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be directing my feeling towards who or what. And I guess that's a good thing. Maybe this movie would have been much worse if it was a very melodramatic over the top big thing. And it definitely wasn't cause it's a very, quiet movie in a weird way like the emotions are big but they're done quietly <laughs> which is interesting but at the time of watching it i kind of was like huh huh i don't know i don't know how i feel like i didn't not like it but i didn't love it and i'm just kind of left in this limbo of like i don't know quite what this movie is i'm still trying to like wrap my brain around it and that's sort of the opinion of like roger ebert's review is basically the same thing of just sort of like Everybody and it's good. The elements are there, but I'm just kind of left sort of stranded at the end being like, huh, I don't understand what just happened in front of me. And that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm interested because I know that you, I mean, for months before this, were like, this movie is so good. And so I'm really excited to kind of hear you make your argument for that because I know because you're an interesting person. And so I know that you wouldn't like something for dumb reasons. So I'm excited to hear kind of like what, what you see in this and hopefully I can listen to that and then kind of put that onto the movie and kind of read more into it than I got out of it initially. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, first of all, to me, just the idea of a Western noir, a color Western noir that takes place in the era of cars and planes and like that it's not this isn't this isn't the old west it's not like the death of the old west this is very much in the time of humphrey bogart yeah like humphrey bogart was in was on movie screens at this point they're playing a lot of hank williams and that that kind of country or Western vibe is just something that there aren't many of. And it really, I'm, I love noir. And I also really love those Technicolor films of the fifties mm -hmm. that I referenced in my description. And it just, it got all of that. And it has this real, like the, 
I guess it's similar to the conflict that's in a lot of Westerns where it's the big cattle business against the small time cowboys. Mm -hmm. But something about putting that in a post-war economic situation just really got me. It really it, it, it made me feel some of the feelings that I get from Some Came Running. Mm. Like the the poker playing and these sort of cool guys. I mean, this is definitely more of a Western. That's more of a Midwestern. But I feel like <laughs> in a way like Dean Martin's <laughs> character could have spent time in this town. I mean, yeah. his name's Bama, so he's more of a Southern guy. But it just like the feeling it's ha it feels like all of those films. So that really that really gets me just the the aesthetic of that. And I I didn't really pick up on it, but I do think that the way Freer's it's a it's funny when you say that it's a that Peckinpah would have direct uh, was going to direct it. It makes sense because there are some really unsettling there's some unsettling treatment of women in this that I really uh, I'm glad Peck and Pa didn't make this film. I like that. <laughs> I, I love that Stephen Frears made it and that he has such a strong feeling for the female characters in a really not pushing it kind of way. Like it doesn't feel in any way like feminist posturing. It's just that his camera and his interest is with them. Mm -hmm. in a way that another film just wouldn't be. Yeah. And I really love this stuff with Woody Harrelson's mom. There's just, mm -hmm. there's only, there's one scene where Woody Harrelson's mom and his grandma are talking to Billy Crudup and Woody Harrelson about Woody Harrelson's dad and his uncles and how they all died violent deaths. Yeah. And even though they're talking about the men the strength of these frontier or they're not even frontier women anymore. They're like these next generation frontier women who carry these stories. I think that probably just spoke to me in a way that, you know, I like Westerns fine, but that it was like, Oh, this is a special Western. This is not, this isn't doing, this is doing a lot of the things that I like in Westerns. It has gunfights <laughs> and horses and men being, tough and whatever but it has this whole other really strong sense of feeling yeah that uh having gone deep into stephen freer's work it's that's that's there mm -hmm. pretty much from the beginning yeah uh for him and yeah the the mustacheless sam elliott is great i mean <laughs> just the cast across the board yeah this is uh th this is also woody harrelson i think this might have been this was in that run where he was doing a lot of really great work. But I think this was one of the first ones that I really, that I really liked. Like natural born killers was a phenomenon, but did I like it? Uh, I don't is, it a, is it a movie you like? I mean, it, it's not a likable. I mean, it's, it's a, it's an impressive film. It's a audacious film. It's a, it's an inspirational film. But it's not a likable film, and his character is terrible and <laughs> disgusting and awful. And same thing with uh, People versus Larry Flint, another one that's like, it was one of the, oh, Woody Harrelson's a movie star now, but uh, do I like, nah, <laughs> Larry Flint, not, you know. <laughs> and then this was the first one where I was just like, oh, yeah. He, this is a movie star performance. Yeah. Um, I just, I really like this. Like I, when we were sp speaking uh, uh, before the show a couple, a few days ago, and after I'd already written the part where I compared it to Legends of the Fall, you were saying that it kind of struck you as that kind of movie. But yeah. to me, the difference is that is just, this is so much better like a much, much better version of that kind of film. The acting's better, the writing's better, the the history's better, the sense <laughs> of the female characters is better. The 90s uh, loved movies like this. For what I don't know what was the first movie like it. Maybe it was Legend of the Fall or Rivers Runs Through It, but they loved these movies about like men being men and they're kind of in the woods and it's about family and then there's like a love triangle, but then one of them goes to a war of some sort and like it's like this kind of epic, not epic sort of thing 
uh it just like a lot about family dynamic and then just sort of like friends as family and it's just like a very interesting i don't know what you would even call that genre but like there was such a thing in the 90s for whatever reason <laughs> yeah in- interesting it's an interesting i don't think people know i can't think of the last movie like this it's been a while but it's like there was a well, time well nobody makes movies like this yeah. anymore cuz <laughs> like, nobody has the budgets to do it and yeah it's just not the kind of movie that that gets made at this point uh, yeah i'm trying yeah what would be like are there there aren't really movie stars like this no you know so yeah, yeah. It uh, and there's a lot of uh, people in this. This is uh, for our webs or for our podcast. This is second Sandy Baron film. Oh yes, <laughs> second Cole Hauser. Yep. Uh, second Penelope Cruz. So we're hitting a lot of number twos here with with people. <laughs> what was the first Cole Hauser? The prom. Oh well, yeah. Okay, I was like, okay, my film. <laughs> <laughs> So. We didn't really do the prom. I, ca- we did. I count it. I count okay. it. We okay. we talked about it. We we ca- I count it. <laughs> okay. That, that yeah, episode no. was, yeah. <laughs> so. And he's great. He's really it's it's a that's a tough role. I, and I feel like he's the low man on the totem pole in terms of all the actors that are in this. But I think he his character to me was the most interesting. Like his character arc was the most fascinating to me because like that is a tough because it, it ultimately kind of ends up being a very unlikable character, uh, even though you can tell the character is trying to do the right thing for him, but he's doing it in such the worst way and just like and then up to the you know tragic end. It's just sort of like, I think he's like, there's a lot of that kind of acting in this movie where it doesn't seem like they're acting but they are acting because they're actors and like Cole Hauser is and like Crudup is the same thing. And like, it's just sort of like, they're doing a lot of like not talking with their faces, but it's like, it's all there. Like, it's like, it's like, it's sort of that emotion within the internal thing. Uh, and it's a, it's hard to do. It's a hard, like, I think there's very few actors that can pull that off. Um, like where you're acting like really only with, your eyes, I guess, <laughs> because you're not showing it on your face. True poker faces uh, to go along with some of the things in this movie. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's, but it didn't, but it it didn't work for you. No, I d- and I don't know why. I haven't quite figured it out. It's weird. Like while I was watching it, I was like, "What is not working for me? I don't know what it is. I can't." Co- quite put my finger on it because everything that's there seems right to me and i don't know i don't know where what's missing for me that is there for you i wonder what it maybe we'll figure it out by the end of this episode like i just don't know what it is i think it might be i i do think that i'm watching it as an actor like there's a it really scratches that james dean film itch and for me, those films were really foundational. Mm-hmm. So that might be part of it. <laughs> I do not know. I can't. You know. Let so let's just let's just, we're. I think we're gonna we're gonna spend a little bit more time just digging into Stephen Frears than this film. But let's just walk. Let's spend a little time walking through the plot of this now. Yeah. Uh, um. I wanted to ask you: Do you have any touchstones for? Like what are your what are the westerns that you love, or even more so, like the, any western noirs that you can think of? Um, you know, I also really like westerns that take place in modern time. Like I really love Lone Star, and I count that movie as a western. And that's another great kind of '90s, full of great actors movie. And I think that movie even took place when it was made. I think that takes place in the '90s, and there's of course flashbacks. But like I love yeah. that movie, and I totally count that as a western. And I, you know, I love all the, you know, nihilistic, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood type stuff. Like I love Unforgiven and I love um, High Plains Drifter. And I love like the really dark, the really dark ones. Like, you know, like I really do like, you know, Wild Bunch. And um, I, it's weird because like as a kid, I hated Westerns. My dad wanted to watch them. I thought they were so boring, had no interest. And then it wasn't until like, later that like when i saw like the searchers or ones that like the darker ones where i was like oh i really like the ones that aren't portraying these guys as heroes 
and it's more fuzzy who's the good guy and the bad guy. And I really like th those kinds of westerns. Um, yeah, and I, I love Deadwood. You know, like another one where it's like there is no good, there are no good guys really in that show. Everybody's deeply flawed. <laughs> um, and I feel like there's just something about that that is appealing to me. And uh, I mean, I live in Texas now, so clearly <laughs> it has an effect on me. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I and I like the ones like where it's it's more about the landscape and you can really see sort of this big country or like I count like like you referenced earlier like I count Giant as a western like Giant is a weird version of a western that's one of my favorite movies like ever um, and in a way I, I can kind of see like James Dean in that movie growing up to be Sam Elliott you know in this movie. <laughs> in this movie like maybe they're the same the same type of person of just like man you've been so corrupted and you you just it's all about the money and you like you're not a real cowboy anymore you're just a, you might as well just live in New York City right right <laughs> <laughs> well you know what since this is so much about the actors and since the plot is i think if we describe the plot it just kind of vanishes cuz it's yeah. it is it's a lot of what I like about it is in the details and in the characterizations, the, you know, cattle drives and gunfights and bar fights and poker games. And, you know, I don't know that all that stuff is sort of like once you describe it, it's like, well, yeah, we've all seen that before. So let's just like <laughs> let's let's walk through these performances and then we'll get into Stephen Frears. So, yeah, let's start with Billy Crudup, which he's playing the he's playing a sort of. Like Nick to Woody Harrelson's Gatsby, he's, he's kind, <laughs> very much yeah. He's sort of the, like the one who is like Woody Harrelson's the man of action, mm -hmm. and he's this sensitive guy, and yeah. I think also for me at the time, you know, it was, I, I was still very much in the acting world. I knew. You know, like I know, I know Cole. I know John Deal. I uh, you know, I, did I? Know, I felt I I didn't know Patricia Arquette yet, but we had both done Nightmare on Elm Street stuff. So I just felt like a kinship with him, and I always felt a really strong kinship with Billy Crudup. But what about you? Do what's your what's your your relationship to Billy? I I think like he's just one of those people that is kind of hard for me because I have a hard time with really handsome men <laughs> like we've talked about my ryan o'neill problem <laughs> in the past and my ryan gosling problem and other people named ryan but there's something about where it's like i just kind of like i watch somebody like him in a movie and i'm always wishing that it was like steve buscemi or somebody more interesting looking so like it's especially when they're younger so it's like oh i'm just looking at you and, and you're the witness in this movie and i'm supposed to be kind of behind your eyes in a way but it's hard for me to relate because you look like such a chiseled, handsome Hollywood guy, you know? And so it's hard for me to kind of maybe that's part of the emotional dissonance that I feel like with him in this movie. But I feel that way with him in other things, too. Like, I feel like I like Jesus' son and I like Almost Famous, but I don't really think I like them because of him. I like Almost Famous because I love philip seymour hoffman you know and it's just like he's always been a hard person and he, and he kind of reminds me of and I, I don't know if he was part of it but he kind of feels like that kind of like post johnny depp sort of like he's in the 90s at the same time as like a skeet oldrich or or like a ballastar getty or whatever these kind of all these sort of like fakey james dean sort of post you know type guys and i can't connect to the actors like that. i just don't really there's something about it that I can't connect to. So like, I've never been a huge fan of his. And then the fact that in this movie, he doesn't say a lot. <laughs> it, like it, I think that definitely was a major hurdle for me to connect to things in this, in this movie. That's I, it's, it's unfortunate because I feel like all those guys you mentioned are pretty lightweight Hollywood guys. And Billy Crudup is a, is a is a New York guy and a really well trained theater actor. His I remember when he was doing his Hamlet on Broadway, 
every sort of like pretentious girl in New York that I knew was just in love with him <laughs> and was like, oh, you, you have to see it. It's the most amazing thing you'll ever see. Uh, and so I get it, but I think it's an unfortunate connection because he is such, he's so much, even as much as I like Johnny Depp, Johnny Depp is not as good an actor as Billy Crudup. And it's, and th that's where the, to me that maybe the, where the world is wrong, sadness hits in is like, if this film had been a hit, then guys like Cole Hauser and Billy Crudup would probably have more, ha have had more opportunities to do more interesting work than they have. This didn't do anything to stop his career. He went on to do several uh, pretty big films after this, and he's continuing to work up till this day. But yeah, he's the guy who should have been, who had the chops to be a much more interesting movie star than certainly than Skeet Ulrich or the or what do you call it? Battlestar <laughs> <laughs> Battlestar Galactic Eddie. Uh... They're not as aligned on Billy Crudup. I'm curious as he's gotten older and is less of such of a handsome chiseled guy. Do you like his later work? More, as a more of a character actor? I'm trying to think if I've even seen any of the things that he did. I don't think I've seen any of the movies he's made in the last, you know, 15 years. I think the last one was Watchmen. You know, I think that's, and you know, he's, I don't really remember him in that movie. I, I, I had to look it up and go, oh, he was in that movie? Oh, okay. <laughs> so like, I don't, there's just something about that doesn't connect, you know, like, like movies like Big Fish, like he's there, but there's something about him that I'm not, it's not reaching me. I don't know what it is because I, I don't know. Like there's something that's, there's a, there's a disconnect between him and me through my television screen <laughs> that, that I, but I mean, I've heard the morning show is good. I heard he's very good in it. I will definitely see it someday. So maybe now that he's like in his fifties. I can, I can, there's something there. I don't, cause like I certainly had to be so, there's other actors like this where I had this opinion. And then eventually I finally, after many years, like figured it out. It kind of reminds me in a way of like, that happens to me with bands all the time. Well, everyone will be, their albums are great. And I'll listen to it and I'll be like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And then it'll, something will just click. Like that certainly happened to me with like Brad Pitt, like forever. I was like, I don't get this guy. I don't like him at all. And then something happened where it's like, oh, I really like him a lot. Or, Ryan Gosling. I hated Ryan Gosling for the longest time. And then it just like clicked. It's like, oh, I get it now. He's really good. No, I was totally wrong. So I'm hoping that'll happen with a crud up someday. That there's some that, that switch will be something will tickle it and I'll 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 see the light that other people see. Yeah, and I just gotta say, I, I'm looking at his uh his Wikipedia and I guess it it must not have been Hamlet. It must have been he did the Elephant Man in two thousand two. I'm sure I remember people talking about him doing Hamlet. So maybe it wasn't on, you know, Wikipedia is not yeah. the best truth. Yeah, but neither is my memory. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's let's move on to uh, to Woody Harrelson. Of course, you know, he's at this point he it, he is a legitimate capital M movie star right yeah. there with you know, Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt. And maybe with a little bit more, uh, I don't know. How, how do you? How would you? How would you? Uh, I, I know we're we're talking about someone that everybody knows, but what's your take on Woody Harrelson? I think like he's really interesting to me because he he's not to me. I don't think he's a, a handsome man. He's not a normal looking guy. There's something goofy about the way he looks, and there's something f funny about the way he talks. Like he seems like it makes sense that he started like on sitcoms and like doing comedy because there to me there's something just inherently funny about him and then when he did natural born killers it was like oh shit like he's like a good actor like he's there's something dangerous there that i didn't see before you know and then he kept tapping into that in the 90s with people versus larry flint and even i could i would even say kingpin of just doing these sort of like dangerous characters these characters that are like wholly unlikable but because it's him there's something interesting or like sympathetic in a way sort of 
or just something just like he, he became so interesting uh and he was on a roll like this like the, he did this movie the same year he did the thin red line like both in the same year and the same uh like right after he did welcome to sarajevo and wag the dog and he was just like constantly just being interesting and still does that and he can still kind of go between brilliant comedy and really good drama and i feel in a way people kind of take him for granted i feel in a way he's kind of like samuel jackson in a way of terms of like he's always good he's always around he's in so many movies every year and we just kind of forget that like they are as good as they are because they it's not as special in a way because he's just always in stuff constantly but is always <laughs> good and someday that won't be the case and we'll miss and we will greatly miss it <laughs> Like, well, like, it'll be sad when there's not a time when Woody Harrelson's is not in like a multitude of TV shows and movies. And like, he's, he's a hardworking man. Like just like every year, like so many things, like in 2019, he did like four or five things. Like he's just always, and he's always good. There's never been a movie that he let down, like, or TV show. Like he is always bringing it always for, forever. Like he's just going to be one of those people that like you can trust that he will be good in whatever thing. Even if it's a terrible movie, you know that you won't be able to take your eyes off of him in that terrible movie. Are there any sort of um, world is wrong performances of his that you feel like, you know, everyone talks about natural born killers or yeah. Kingpin or are, what are, if, are there any that you're like, you know, this, he showed up in this one and I, really loved it <laughs> i think one that it's a movie everyone loves but i think he was totally overshadowed by everyone else's performances is i really like him in no country for old men i think mm -hmm. he's really good in that but because everybody else in that movie was working on such crazy levels of acting that his sort of more understated performance got kind of buried and i think he's totally great in that and i really like his scenes in that movie a lot and i think that he's just great in that movie um, I think that he's, I really love the movie Seven Psychopaths and he's very good in that. And that's a movie that nobody really talks about or people kind of dismissed as a weird, you know, third rung Pulp Fiction or whatever, or the, the movie that just isn't as good as the other two movies that the director made. He's great in that movie. That movie's really good. Um, I don't know. I just think he's just always just interesting and great. Like I... If if people sh like Solo, we covered Solo. He's very good in that movie. He's so good. Like he's so Woody Harrelson, but also like it's just like it's such a great feeling when he's on screen in that movie. Like it really adds so much to it. So like yeah, I think he's just you know if there's a if there's a movie like the guy's made you know lots of things. He's had a long career. So if there's a movie or TV show that he's done that people aren't talking about, then the world is wrong. Cause it should be like all of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like he doesn't have any awards. You know, he doesn't, he's never won an Oscar. Like the fact that he didn't win an Oscar in the nineties when he was doing all that high caliber stuff, like interesting, challenging stuff. Like I what? think yeah. I, I kind of think that also speaks to what a movie star he is. He is, you're right. Samuel Jackson, I think Humphrey Bogart. He's one of these guys who is so just himself in it, even though he's acting. Like, he's so good that he never seems like he's acting, no matter how different the role is. Yeah. It always yeah. feels like you feel just you. I think people just relax when he walks onto <laughs> screen. You're just like, OK, but yeah. But I think that's what makes like his character. That's what makes his Larry Flint or like his character in Natural Born Killers so much more disturbing is that it is kind of relaxed. It does feel real. Like it feels like that's that that's him. That's this character is real. And you don't want those people to be real. <laughs> Like, Larry Flint's not real, right? That was just a character in a movie? Please tell me that wasn't an actual person. Um, nope. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Break this deal. Oh, no. Uh, but, yeah. like, And I think that's, like, when he can get into that dangerous place, like, or even in True Detective, where it's, like, because he's such a... His characters feel so lived and they feel so, like, like he can just walk out of the TV into your room, you know? And when he goes into that dangerous place, 
Uh, and even in Hilo Country, he kind of goes there. There's parts where you're like, what are you doing? Oh, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. Like, it's it's uh, it's it's very exciting. It's very exciting to oh, watch Oh, but him. he's... You know? Well, I, I'll just say, uh, I, wa I want to talk a little bit about his performance in the Hilo Country, but I was looking through, the, through his filmography, and there is a film that I feel like the world is wrong about that... Uh, people should check out if they if they want to go deep on Woody Harrelson. Paul Meadow from the same year, uh, 1998, he did The Thin Red Line, The High Low Country. And in between them came out, he came out with Paul Meadow, with him and Elizabeth Shue. And it's another noir, mm -hmm. this, much more of a traditional noir film. And some of the scenes with him and Elizabeth Shue are just crackling oh boy <laughs> i've never seen that i've always wondered about that one i should check that one out yeah that is a hot sweaty body heat of a film <laughs> uh, really really great so let's talk a little bit about him in so it, him in the high low country he plays big boy mattson w were there any standout I, I i imagine he was one of the points that you <laughs> did connect with yeah i mean i really loved the, the poker scene like the big the poker scene he's so they're, they're like, <laughs> when he when he, he kills a guy he kills a guy by winning a hand at poker and then he yeah. gloats about it afterwards where it's just like he wins his thing gives the poor guy a fatal heart attack <laughs> and afterwards he's like ah fuck that guy good i'm glad and he's like round of drinks on everybody you know like it's uh if think if it's any other actor you would really hate that character at that moment you'd be like fuck that guy but because it's woody harrelson you're like oh, i'm along for the ride on this one okay and so much of the movie, he seems like he's having the time of his life. He's really having a great time. But then there is sort of like this little bit of a secret sadness behind there, or just like the relationship with his brother or like his, his love for Patricia Arquette's character is ultimately just like really sad and tragic and just sort of like the way he is irresponsible in this movie, the way he stands up uh, to Sam Elliott. It just like all like it's a very roller coaster of a, of a role in a way and he's 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 great and i think you could totally watch this movie and think oh he's not punching above here he's just doing woody harrelson but that's not true and especially if you look at all the other movies he made around this time even this same year it's very different than what he was doing he doesn't wasn't playing just like this kind of character yeah this is definitely a performance but again because it's woody harrelson it doesn't feel like acting yeah <laughs> yeah uh, yeah, no, Woody, Woody Harrelson is is great in this. So uh, let's let's move on through the cast, and uh, let's 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 move on to Patricia Arquette, also on fire in the '90s, like also just like constantly making so many good things and so many different things, like so good in this deck. I remember just like loving her so much at the time, just like seeing everything she was in. And just getting so excited every time, like from from like True Romance through Ed Wood to like Beyond Rangoon, um, like Lost Highway, and and just kind of like in Lost Highway, and, and even I would say in a way Ed Wood, there's just sort of like an intense sadness to her character in High Low Country, and in those movies, there's just something that's like there's something really tragic about these these characters. Like, not like an intense tragedy. It's not like the, everyone's dying around or anything, but there's just something about, like, where she is placed in her life and how the, the people around her. It's like there's something really sad about it. Yeah, and dreamy. It's, like, as an actor, she's kind of like a psychedelic. <laughs> in that she just, she kind of floats through these films. She has this quality of... If it was somebody, if it was somebody else, it would seem fake, but it's really just her, right? Mm -hmm. There's something about it, and she was on an amazing run. Uh, even after this, like I really love Stigmata, Bringing Out the Dead, Little Nikki. She's yeah. great in Human Nature, a movie we'll totally cover yep. someday. She's great in that movie. Yes, uh, doing weird things like the movie Tiptoes, uh, Fast Food Nation, uh, just like taking chances, being in. A good mix of like weird little things, big things. And she still does that. Even, you know, like even though Boyhood won her the Oscar, that is a weird movie. That's a movie is kind of a like to, to commit to make a movie that'll take 13 years. Like not everyone would do that. She was one of the best characters on Boardwalk Empire. Like she's just constantly. Yes. I love that you brought that up. So good. She, 
Wow. I mean, she's barely in that show. But so much weight is brought. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and did you see Escape to Danamora? No, I haven't. Sh- oh, no, Escape at Danamora. That is a performance. Oh, my God. That is, it's the the prison escape film with Benicio del Toro, directed by Ben Stiller, mm-hmm. and she, boy, she is a. I don't want to say an egoless actor, but she is willing to put herself into some very unattractive places as an actor, mm-hmm. in a way that is just. Uh, is very is admirable not in a way of just like oh that's admirable but it's admirable because it's driven by such great acting but that's a film where she is a very unsympathetic bordering on disgusting character <laughs> and that is really like that's just a few years after boardwalk empire in which she is nothing but like powerful and charismatic and uh yeah yeah, yeah. I I love that lady. She is great. <laughs> there was a time where if you had asked me, I would have said she was my favorite actress. Like there was definitely like a, a pocket of my life where that was sort of my go to answer um, for that. And I'm just seeing here. She also like we in, in an earlier episode, we talked about how Amanda Seyfried played Linda Lovelace. Patricia Arquette also played Linda Lovelace in a film called Deeper Than Deep. So, Never even heard of that. 2003, which I haven't seen. Huh. I have not seen. I don't think but any of these know. casting agents saw what Linda Lovelace actually looked like. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like Amanda Seyfried or Patricia Arquette. Her name is Seyfried. Uh, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just saying there's definitely like, not a, there's probably an actress out there that could have gotten the job because they looked more like her, but they're not going for that, I guess. Anyways. <laughs> so what about in this film? In this film, she plays John Deal's wife. And when Billy Crudup comes home from the war, they have a moment. Like, she's already sort of sneaking out on John Deal. Mm-hmm. And they have a kiss in the parking lot. And really, she gets under Billy Crudup's skin. Yeah. And then the next time he sees her, she's already fallen in with... Woody Harrelson's character. Yeah. And so there that's really the sort of the heart tugging yeah. thing in the film is that and I just I love like there's no jealousy. There's just this honor among all of these people. Like she yeah. really cares about both of them and and both of them really care about the like there's all this deep caring from all of them and this dance of not telling each other yeah. things. And it's just I Boy, that part of the film is so rich to me, and I just don't see that. Like, most films take the jealousy thing and just put the... It's a really easy thing to communicate cinematically. Yeah. It's a really easy button to push. And when a film consciously goes in another direction, that's... Like, you know that Peckinpah would Yeah, I feel that. like, yeah, I think that that's got to be a, the Stephen Frears touch in a way of just, like, anybody else making this movie... Would have had the two guys duking it out, rolling in the mud, just like a scene of them, like just screaming at each other, punching each other, like you betrayed me. But you're right; it's kind of like, and and you know, we we do spoilers on this, so I'll just open us up a bit. Be, you know, watch the movie if you haven't seen it yet; it's stop it now. But like, you have a part where eventually, uh, Billy Crudup's character sleeps with Patricia Arquette. He rapes her. Yeah. I mean, she, it's a very, it's not portrayed as a violent thing. It's portrayed as a pathetic thing. Again, very Freers. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't go for the easy outrage. Yeah. And there's just this house sad, like her, Patricia Arquette's response is like, oh, this is so sad for you. Yeah. And like that part is so tragic because it's just like the whole movie in a way was kind of building up to this moment and you're hoping it was going to be like a nice thing and it's not a nice thing, but it's also not like the worst thing. Like the way it's portrayed is very strange um, because they're, up to this point, like you don't think anything like it's just like the fact that they, the characters are in that situation is very interesting. And in that scene, she is so good and tragic because you can tell she is not happy about it. She just kind of does it. 
And even afterwards, he's not. And just sort of like this really sad thing that happens. But in any other movie, after that happened, Woody Harrelson would have like eventually come storming out of some bar drunk and like punched him out. And then you get this weird thing just like later in the movie, Billy Crudup finds out that he already knew about it and didn't do anything about it. He was just like, oh, yeah, he knew you slept with her. You know, he, he knew. But, you know, it's just like it's just like it's just like an interesting way it's handled. And if the, yeah, you're right. If this is Peck and Paw, this would have been like guys punching each other in like a big blowout scene. Uh, or they would have, or he would have made her that character into such a disgusting. It was like her cram. fault. It was her that fault, or something. It was her yeah, fault, yeah. and that uh, they bonded over how much they hate her. Yeah, and like <laughs> that would have been that that delightful Peck and Paw touch. Uh, but luckily, we didn't get that. So it's a goodness, but yeah, like the way the love triangle is done is like, I think because it's quieter and because it's a lot of unsaid stuff, it makes it all that more tragic than if it was like this bigger, you know, melodramatic thing. And for some reason, that is one of the things that makes it feel more like a noir Mm -hmm. than a... Uh, than a, a melodrama or a Western that tonally it's just sort of ambiguous and the characters are a little bit, just a little bit less reactionary. Yeah. They're sort of, a, they're cooler. Their response to bad things is cooler, not in the sense of like, I'm cool, but in the sense of like, not hot, like, Oh yeah, that's the way it is. It, to, to me, that's a very st- Stephen Frears thing. Like, that reminds me a lot of how the people are in High Fidelity or The Hit or even The Grifters. Like, it's just sort of like the way that people handle with things that would have been a bigger, like, I'm a bad guy or I'm the good guy and I hate what you did bad. And it, it kind of all lies in this sort of kind of like moral ambiguity, like limbo, where it's just like nobody's really bad, nobody's really good, nobody's really acting bad big and announcing that they're good or bad they're just sort of like how people are (laughs) in real life there is no you know black or white it really is like his characters kind of work in this gray area in terms of sort of like their feelings and their morals and and things and that to me is very an interesting place to be as a filmmaker yeah yeah well let's switch to the other main female lead in this film which is Penelope Cruz in her introduction to American cinema and whoa boy I again I that's one of those things like this just for that this film should have been a hit because she is I think she's just I don't know a transcendent in this role in the sense of like not in the sense of like she's acting her acting is transcendent but as a being showing up on cin- on on screen she is immediately she was already a uh, a big star in Spain but this was i don't know to me the inter- more than anyone else in the film she walks on to screen like James Dean <laughs> like who is what is this this creature that I can't take my eyes off. What, what, what was your response to it? I think she's the most sympathetic person in this movie for me. And the one that I liked the most, like <laughs> she's the one where like, and again, it's like without her even saying anything, she's just like, has there's something so emotional about her and everything. And in a way it's kind of sad. This is her American intro because I feel like she kind of got lost in movies for a while in America and they, no one really knew what to do with her as much. And then she got interesting again when she went, you know, back to working with like Alma Devar or whatever. So I just feel like it's, it's, it's sort of a sad thing to me because I feel like she could have been so much more in a way. And they didn't quite know. She kind of got locked in that, like you're pretty and you're from another country in a lot of movies, certainly not here, but I think that kind of happened with her and some of her Hollywood stuff was they didn't know. And that's Hollywood's fault. They didn't know quite what to didn't understand. I mean, the same thing happened with Antonio Banderas who also came out of the, Elmo Devar stuff is someone was just like, oh, he's this hunky guy. Let's put him in this dumb action crap. When it's like, no, no, he's a fucking great actor. Like, watch the old stuff in Spain that he did. Like, <laughs> and, uh, but she's good. There's just something so emotional about her, just like instantly. Just like, you just like look into her eyes and you're starting to feel things. And the fact that, yeah, Billy Crudup's character is so 
just not great to her. It's just like it's like it's like yeah, watching it's... someone just like yell at a kitten or something. <laughs> it's like, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, and it's, it's not terrible. just from the from the jump. He is lying to yeah, her, takes advantage of her and niceties, telling and her love yeah. that she gives him, and it's... and all the time you're like, you fool, like stop chasing Patricia Arquette. Like you have a great woman waiting for you right yeah. there. Like what are you doing? <laughs> like you're blowing it. <laughs> now, so here's a question: Is that like? Is that a case of bad casting in the sense, like, is she like, so, you know, the story about uh, um, Streetcar Named Desire that Tennessee Williams, he saw why Brando had to be in the in the play and he was drawn to Brando. But in the end, he felt like Brando being in Streetcar Named Desire ruined it because the character is a villain and Brando as a being was so charismatic that he was all anyone wanted to see. And you're supposed to hate that guy. <laughs> you're not supposed to be attracted yeah. to him. Maybe you can get how she's attracted to him, but she ju- he's just like, no one knew he was going to be Brando <laughs> when they cast him. Yeah. In it. And I feel like there's something about this. Like she's the fact that in the script says that Billy Crudup has to do that Pete, Calder has to do these ter- like he doesn't really he just treats her so shabbily and <laughs> clearly she is the best thing there's, in this whole movie in terms of there's humans. that really awkward great scene where they're kind of doing like a makeout contest where like he's they're around the fire and Woody Harrelson's kissing oh that's Patricia the Arquette. worst and so then Billy Crudup is like well fine I'll I'll make out with Penelope Cruz in the same way even though I will be thinking of Patricia Arquette and you can tell that Penelope Cruz's character knows what he's doing and it's just such bullshit and he doesn't it's there's no actual passion there he's just trying to like one up the other people because of jealousy or some weird thing and that part is so uncomfortable <laughs> great actually that scene is I think one of the most important scenes in the film because not only is he terrible but Patricia Arquette uh-huh. her character is really awful to Penelope Cruz's character. Just mean and white privilege just so shitty. Uh, <laughs> it almost, it's not like it justifies, but it m- makes sense that this, it's again, Freer's being very smart about humanity. Like he doesn't make any of them bad. Yeah. But he also lets them be bad. Yeah. And so when the, Basically, when the rape happens, we've already seen the worst thing we're going to see that evening, which is their all of their treatment of the Penelope Cruz character. But then she gets back at them <laughs> and she takes them to the witch, to the fortune teller. They say, is it the witch? They say, I'm going to take you to the witch. They, they call her a witch. Yeah. And that's when we get Katie Gerardo. And I want to talk about that. But before we do, do you want to say anything else about Penelope Cruz in the film? I don't know, just like to me, she's like the heart in a way, but which it's hard because like everyone is so terrible to her. But I think like she is sort of like the emotional glue in all the scenes that she's in. Like she kind of like makes it so this movie isn't totally cold and, <laughs> and trying to read between the lines of these actors faces. Like she really brings, I think she really brings it and is very good. And, and, and Freers really knows how to use her. And I think for her first sort of out the gate in Hollywood performance does a great job. So good job. Penelope Cruz's agent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hilo country and Don Juan. <laughs> was where we first met her and she yeah. was great in both yeah um okay so now how familiar are you with katie gerardo not at all really i don't because she's oh go on no i didn't i didn't know that that was a special person until you mentioned it in this episode yeah well katie gerardo uh, was a mexican born actress who was discovered for american films by bud bedeker and john wayne in 1951 and she appeared as gary cooper's ex-mistress in high noon from 1952 for which she won a golden globe award making her the first mexican born actress to be so honored um she got an Academy Award nomination for her role in Edward Dimitrik's Broken Lance in 1953, also a first for Mexican-born actresses. 
Uh, what else? Louis Bunuel cast her in El Bruto in 1953, and she played Slim Pickens' wife in Peck and Paws, Pat Garrett, and Billy the Kid. Uh, she was married and divorced from Ernest Borgnine, but not before having an affair with Marlon Brando that led to her role as Carl Malden's wife in One-Eyed Jacks, and also probably made Ernest Borgnine really insecure. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. It's just it's one of those points where Frears is showing his sophistication in terms of playing with his medium in a way that, that speaks to me. And then she plays the witch who basically is the fortune teller who tells them all this bad news, which then leads to the very nihilistic coupling between Billy Crudup and Patricia Arquette's character, leading to to him basically carrying her out of the woods and Penelope Cruz looking on and being like, she doesn't say it, but the subtext is fucking white people. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and... I hadn't really thought of it until just as we're talking about it, but she did get back at them, but she got back at them in the best way of like, okay, I'm just going to show you the truth. You know? Yeah. No, she didn't have to tell them anything. Just the, the witch tells them, you know, you're, you're what it, Billy Crudup asks, are we all going to be together and alive next year? And she says, no. And that leads him to he, go out and rape Patricia Arquette, which is, you know, not how we, we just want to say we don't endorse that response to bad news. Far better <laughs> to far better to really think about it and, uh, you know, tell your friend Big Boy to, you know, to cool his jets a little bit. But you can't, because a guy like Big Boy Matson is is destined to be Big Boy Matson, and that's where the the tragedy in this film comes in. So, did you have any response to the that uh, the fortune telling scene or anything about um, that? That I did really like that scene. I like that this kind of has this weird mystical moment in a way in the middle of this movie that feels very like real, you know, and like to throw this kind of like go to the fortune teller, and she accurately predicts it. So she actually is clairvoyant or something, <laughs> or just really good at guessing. But I think I really like, I like that little spooky moment in there is, is nice. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, the other heavies in this film, we've got, of course, Sam Elliott and John Deal and Cole Hauser any uh, anything you want to say about these these gents and their? <laughs> it's a good it's a good little vil, villain collection in this movie. Like just like Sam Elliott has this great like I can almost see this role being played by like John Huston or something a long time ago. Just sort of like you're this big guy, you come in, you don't have to say anything, but you just like wield this power, and you sit down, and everyone's kind of like, "Ooh, who's this guy?" Or other people behind your back are like, "Ah, oh, fuck this guy." And <laughs> I think. It's it's interesting because Sam Elliott to me is usually so likable in things, but I think like that kind of innate charisma that he has really is interesting for a character that is kind of despicable, like the one here where you like you can tell how he got his power and got everyone to do his bidding and has this like crew of these dudes who just kind of do whatever he wants and kiss his ass, like because he has there is something like handsome and charismatic that kind of draws you in uh, to him. Uh, and I think that's much more interesting than if it was just like a shitty guy or just like a, a, a more obviously evil, you know, character or bad character or whatever. Um, yeah, no, he's good. It's uh, it's it's a it's a good role for because rarely does he play a bad guy, or like you know, or just someone who's sort of you don't trust. Yeah, and again, as we're breaking this down, when you think about it. What's the worst thing he does in this film? He tries to buy out Big Boy and Pete, which I, it's not like he doesn't try. Like as far as Western boss <laughs> stuff to do or even noir boss stuff to do, he doesn't try and kill anyone. He doesn't really try and muscle anyone. 
the I guess what he does is he kind of seems to enjoy the horrible situation that John Deal is in, like <laughs> that his henchman is in with with Big Boy. Like I there's something about it because he just sort of smiles and enjoys he kind of smiles and enjoys making all this money. Yeah. And I guess we're supposed to hate him because he's responsible for the death of the Re- the West <laughs> or because he didn't go to World War II. Like, when you really unpack it, he's not the bad guy in this Yeah, film. like, it's not like he's, like, destroying people's homes and being like, this is where my my ranch is now. Or, like, you get out of here. This is mine. You know, like, like, in a way, he's doing that. But, like, in a way where people are, like, by their own free will, like selling him things and working for him. And it's not like, yeah, it's not like he has the, like, it's weird. He has the town under his thumb, but in a way that doesn't feel like, well, he's not like abusing anybody. It's just like, he just kind of is the richest guy there. And so by default, you're kind of the bad guy in this movie about like cowboys trying to hold on to the West or whatever. You know what? It's kind of like, you know, you talked about Lone Star. It's kind of like the, the, um, Matthew McConaughey character in Lone Star. Like, you know, he's the father who sort of built the town, got rid of the old sheriff, brought some order and good business to the t- this border town. And then the son is trying to figure out the mystery about did he really kill the sheriff and what's what's his legacy? But he's not a bad guy. He's a successful American living in society and making things work in that gray area that, you know, that is the reality at any time, right? There, like, there are villains, but I, 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 this is really the first time that thinking about this movie, which I've thought about a lot over the years, where I realized that Sam Elliott isn't the, is, is <laughs> not even, he doesn't do anything. The only thing he does that's kind of villainous is when he has, a comes in and he says, I had a banner year to all these guys <laughs> who didn't have a banner year. And that's shitty. But is that shittier than than Woody Harrelson buying everyone around to drinks Someone and dead. celebrating? Yeah, or Billy Crudup's character <laughs> assaulting a woman. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those maybe these guys are the bad guys. He's just a, he's just a heroic rich guy. Like, leave him alone. Let him be rich. He's not real. I don't know if he's heroic either. He's just, he's just kind of like, <laughs> he's not special. Maybe that's the, maybe that's his crime is that big boy Matson is special. Yeah. And Sam Elliott isn't. <laughs> and he's the unspecial guy who stayed back and just made money. And Woody Harrelson, in a, actually taking this into, into sort of an English mythology sort of sense is that, Woody Harrelson is the guy who should have been king, right? He's the the knight who should have been king. But, of course, he shouldn't have been because he's a complete... Like, he couldn't run anything. <laughs> anyway, who knows? Who knows what how things could have, could have gone for him if uh, things hadn't gone so poorly between him and little boy. <laughs> Not to be confused with little devil. <laughs> uh, even though little boy is kind of a little devil. Um and John Deal is just, I think he's great in this. He's great in everything, but he is such a, I don't know, just a weak, sad figure. In well, this yeah, just film. like he knows, like, and that's really an interesting works. touch too, is like in any other movie, they would have made his character, like Patricia Arquette's husband, part of that love triangle, part of the drama. And he's just so meek and nothing. He just sort of lets it happen. And is kind of is quietly sad. And is kind of like, oh, well. Like, he stands up a little bit for it, but not really. Like, he just sort of just lets it happen and just kind of caves in and be like, yeah, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. And in any other movie, that would have been, like, part of the high drama is his character dealing with this situation with his wife cheating on him with two different people that we know of in the movie. So, yeah, he definitely is, like, a very weak... But then it makes sense that he is, like, bossed around you know, by Sam Elliott's character, because he just seems like such a weak, cowardly man. There was some, there was some great line in it where someone's talking about yellow and Woody Harrelson's like, yellow's not my color. <laughs> but it's definitely Deal's character's color. 
<laughs> yeah. And and then there's the kid, uh, Darren E. Burroughs. Darren Burroughs. And he was in Northern Exposure. And he plays one of the gang of cowboys. He's the one who pisses on <laughs> Sam Elliott's lawyer. Yeah. Uh, that's all. The, he's the one who really gets pushed around. He gets pissed on. And then he dies in the, <laughs> in the poker game. And he's he's really great. He's actually a pretty compelling sort of uh, face of an actor. But uh, did, did, are, did you recognize him? Because he's been in a lot of stuff. The lawyer? No, Darren Burroughs, the one who does the pissing. No, I never saw Northern Exposure, so no, I did not, I did not recognize him. He was in Crybaby. He was in Amistad and 976 Evil. And actually, he was in... Uh, Class of 1999, a film that I was almost in uh, for, and, and uh, it's one of the only things I ever turned down, and it was the <laughs> worst decision I ever made in Hollywood. But that's for another. That's for another time. You could that's have been in the time. Hilo Country for all you. <laughs> I think that also might be part of. I watch it in with a sense of watching, not something that I ever was had an opportunity to be in but with that sense of i definitely felt an odd kinship with it that uh maybe allowed me to enjoy it more than just watching it like i did i didn't feel watching uh, um legends of the fall or a river runs through it i don't really i don't know you know i, I guess I, probably if i was if i dug deep i'd probably know someone or i've brushed up against someone so that probably isn't entirely it who knows who knows what it is? But I think we're coming sort of to the end of our discussion of this film, and we should probably shift to digging into Stephen Frears. Yeah. But I'm curious, having unpacked it like this, do you feel like a greater appreciation for the film? or I, maybe I do, because because I honestly started this episode being like, I don't remember anything about this movie at all. Like, there's no, I can't. what am I going to talk about? I don't remember. Like, the movie just happened, and then I just kind of, like, forgot about it. But then, like, the more we're talking about it, unpacking it through the point of view of the actors, then I'm like, oh, in that moment, oh, in this scene. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute, there's a lot of this movie that is really interesting. It is it is very much an actor's movie, I think. And I think I was maybe looking at it through, I kind of went through it as like, oh, this is the Stephen Frears movie. And it is. But I think, like, kind of looking at it through by with the actors and the performances and the subtlety in there, I feel like giving it a second viewing, I'll definitely appreciate more because I think I was sort of expecting something different in terms of the filmmaking and I should have just been paying attention to the performances. And I feel like we've been, we've been digging up a lot of interesting stuff just by going through the list of actors. Well, I'm glad I'm glad. And I do hope that we can encourage people to check this out and encourage Tubi to pick it up. Come on. <laughs> Tubi should just be listening to our podcast and going through and just grabbing just, it all and putting it out there. <laughs> Now, this is a film I found a Guardian article from 2020 that ranks all of Stephen Freer's films. Hmm. And there are 24 films on the list. And The High Low Country comes in at number 12. Oh. And they say this is one of Freer's most underrated movies. A Western to which he brings a cool, understated intelligence and revisionist flair, working from a script by Waylon Green, who also wrote The Wild Bunch. Patricia Arquette plays a lonely woman in post-war New Mexico who is drawn to a number of men who aren't her husband. Billy Crudup's young rancher and Woody Harrelson's outrageously brash cowboy. The booming-voiced Sam Elliott plays a wealthy local man who tries to help and advise the hopelessly naive Crudup a film with real texture and force. I would say I really am down with the first two sentences and the last sentence, but the way that they frame this film is terrible. <laughs> That's wrong. That's... Wait, the film is about Patricia Arquette's character. How is that what this film is about? It's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's really, it's all about Billy Crudup's character, but they can't say this, say that in this because probably people just, don't think about Billy Crudup as a movie star. Or maybe in anyway, England, he didn't connect in England. Or, you know, who knows? <laughs> I, I guess the point is, he seems like the kind of American actor that Brit the British would like. But maybe they're like, oh, no, we want our 
American actors to be like Woody Harrelson, just like realists, realistic guys. And Billy Crudup is too much of an actor. Like he's not <laughs> good enough to be an English actor. So why bother? Uh, who knows? I guess my point was saying that the high low, that at least in the UK, the high low country seems to be getting uh, some more respect and love than it's getting here, which again makes sense in this certain, I think, one dimensional way in that, oh, okay, well, in England, they like his Western, and in America, we don't. <laughs> I do, but in general, it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, it's it doesn't it's not loved like um, there will be blood. Yeah. Anyway, let, let's we're this is going to be a long one because we really need to. We, we promised people we were going to unpack Stephen Frears and we just unpacked this film for about an hour and a half. So <laughs> so let's let's shift. Let's give every let's give everyone a like a moment. Bathroom to break. Take a break. <laughs> take a pause. You know, well, maybe let's let's. So we're going to throw in a little something in here and then we'll come back and we're going to really go into Stephen Frears. Dear listener, if you are just discovering our podcast, you can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at theworldiswrongpodcast.com or follow us on Instagram at theworldiswrongpodcast. And now... Back to the show. Have you ever thought about being a sex worker? Or robbing a bank? Or maybe you're bored and thinking of climbing Mount Everest on a whim. If you've got a bad idea, we've got good advice from the people who've been there. Hi, I'm Marty Caproni. And I'm Joe Garrix. And we're the hosts of the brand new podcast, Good Advice for Bad Ideas, right here on the Paper House Podcast Network. It will be interesting. We promise. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe by Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform. Okay, folks, uh, we're breaking this one up. This one went long. We ended up talking about Stephen Frears for another couple of hours. And rather than dump a four hour podcast on you or three and a half hour podcast on you, we decided to just uh, break this up into two parts. You okay with that, Brian? I think it's a good idea. I think, why not? That, and it gives people another, you know, a little bit of time to watch every Stephen Frears movie. <laughs> yeah, I almost did it. So you should too. Um, so, uh, let's, let's just talk a little bit about, uh, well, in next week's episode, you talk about the most recent episode of the director's wall, where you, uh, explored, where you are currently exploring the work of Francis Ford Coppola. So we'll just let people listen to that. I'm kind of curious in a previous episode, in our intro episode, you've, you talked about your love for Martin Scorsese, and uh, you have in, in subsequent podcasts. And since he was the producer of the High Low Country, and we didn't really mention that in the episode, do you want to talk at all about uh, Martin Scorsese as a producer? Yeah, I think he is a very, he, he's one of those people, I think more so than Spielberg, who also put his name as a producer in a lot of movies in the 80s and 90s. I think you get more of, a stamp of approval when it's a Scorsese thing. It's like Spielberg seemed to use his name just on anything. It's like, oh, there's a dinosaur in it. Yeah, put my name and say Steven Spielberg presents whatever cartoon. But like Scorsese, like if you look at the movies he's produced, which were all kind of like started in the 90s, they're these sort of like smaller, very genre, very much a thing that he would like to watch sort of movie. It's, he's not just doing this for money or just for credit. Like, it really does start with the grifters in 1990. That's the first one. And then you have like a mad dog and glory. So you're kind of seeing this like kind of crime, low budget nineties version of noir in a way. Um, then he gets really into the indie stuff like naked in New York, search and destroy all very kind of New York stuff like clockers. And then high low country seems sort of like the odd man out with that, but not really. If you know Scorsese, like he loves, 
Like, have you ever watched the... Per- it's called, like, The Personal History of Cinema. With I Martin love Scorsese. that. It's one of my favorite like, film documentaries. He's, he's such a fan of, like, directors like Stephen Frears. I guess Stephen Frears was a director in the 50s. Like, that makes sense. Like, these people that, like, don't really write it necessarily, but they just are these dependable people who show up and they have their own style and they kind of play by the studio rules in a way, but are able to sneak in their personal stuff or as scorsese you know, or, would call it smuggling he would call smuggling it smuggling so, like, the ideas in yeah you knowing that he loves like bud bedeker films totally makes sense that he would look at the script of hilo country and be like oh this could totally be like a 90s bud bedeker film or something like like we can do this sort of genre western in a different way and really play play it up and like and i get this stephen frears who's sort of like this guy who's doing all these different types of genre movies and like yeah let's the like that's a movie i want to put money in so like, i think it totally makes sense that he has produced a few furious movies and like they feel like movies that scorsese would watch in like um yeah so what i think is, it's like, if you see his name as a producer that's a good stamp of approval i think for a movie i think you can trust it where does grace of my heart fit in there that is like right before this. Like that was like right after that was like ninety mid nine little early late nineties. Mm-hmm. So it would be like this is nine High Low Country's ninety eight. So that that would be like a few years before that. Like ninety five, ninety six. Yeah. 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 That's an that's another one that of his that's yeah, it's a it's an interesting little run of films that he chose to produce. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, he's great. Yeah. And I think if I ever did a director's role on Scorsese, I would include stuff he produced. Like I don't we wouldn't normally do that, but there's something about him having his name on it that just kind of it means something. There's something whether he's on the set ever or not, it seems like there's something about that that kind of rubs off on your impression of the movie and just sort of like maybe the people making a movie knowing like, "Oh, I'm making a movie that Martin Scorsese is executive producing. I got to do this or that or make it more like a part of cinema. I can't phone this in, you know, like, yeah, this isn't a batteries not included sort of situation. Did he have something to do with to die for? (laughs) Um, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think he did. Not as a producer, anyways. Okay, I don't know. Maybe presented by. I don't, let's I don't let's know. give him credit for every. Uh, <laughs> did he all? Didn't he? Didn't he produce the Big Lebowski? No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> just thinking of good films from the '90s. Let's just give him credit for all of them. Or any movie that has "Gimme Shelter" on the soundtrack, they should send him ten dollars. <laughs> it's be like okay. <laughs> uh. So, yeah, and. Uh, just so we can just breeze through the the plug to Radio 8 Ball. It's a podcast that I do. Uh, I haven't been doing it recently, but there's a whole bunch of them up there. What, what, what do I do on that podcast, Brian? I love hearing you fumble your way through explaining it to people. <laughs> you ask, you like to ask a question, you know? I, and, yeah. then he, and then, or you have a guest that asks a question. Oh, yeah. uh-huh, uh-huh. And then you answer that question by picking a song at random. And then you use that question, that music, as the answer to the question, and it ends, and it adds a great. There's always a great synchronicity to it, and it ends up being a very deep, truthful thing. Whatever the song tells, is it that? Does that work? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's really good. That's really good. And <laughs> and and I've been. I was thinking about uh, Radio Eight Ball in terms of <clears throat> Stephen Frears because. If you believe the the numbers of the downloads for that are listed where we where we post the podcast, Radio Eight Ball is currently more popular in India than it is in the United <laughs> States, and so I huh. feel like some sort of like kinship with Stephen Frears, and that maybe maybe like if I if I went to India and made the show a hit there. Then I could come back to America, and people would take me more seriously, and let me <laughs> let me make some TV series. Uh, huh? And uh, why, why well, is it pop more popular in India? That's interesting. I think because it's an it's you know and it, it's a uh, the you know India is the birthplace of Buddhism. It's a you know, yeah. It's an older, more enlightened society, and <laughs> so you know Radio Eight Ball, and it's you know it's leaning into synchronicity into that sort of 
mystical yeah. way of viewing the world. I just feel like it must. I, I, I mean, who knows? Maybe I'm just. I have no idea. I. I. This is what I have. <laughs> this is what I tell myself when I look at these numbers. Wow. You wow. Know? That's in, that's very interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's like uh, where we the the city where I think we have the least listeners uh, is the city we're both from. <laughs> <laughs> Olympia, <laughs> because they're like, oh, f- those fucking guys. Oh, We've God. heard them in person. Yeah. Talk. Oh, we don't need to. I don't need to spend yeah. any more time with those guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. anyway, so kind of interesting, kind of, kind of, kind of weird, kind of, kind of funny, kind of strange. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, just something, to, something to think of, but not too much. It's been, actually, think about Stephen Frears. Get, get, get ready. Watch a bunch of Stephen Frears films. Watch all of Stephen Frears films because we're going to be digging into all of them, <laughs> minus a couple that I still feel bad that we didn't, that I didn't get to. But uh, you know, he has a lot of movies. So uh, if you have, uh, if you do uh, have thoughts to share about our take on the High Low Country. Or about Stephen Frears, you can write to us at contact at the world is wrong com. You can find all of our podcasts at www.theworldiswrongpodcast. You can find us on Instagram at the world is wrong podcast. And you can also find the videos for these, these episodes at our YouTube channel. And all of those links are in the show notes, so you can you don't have to you don't have to write them down and memorize them. We keep them there for you. And so, uh, yeah. Until next time, uh, I'm one of your hosts, and uh, Brian, you're the other. I, I assume you you back <laughs> me in this message that I, that I give the yeah. people every every week, which is that uh, I want you all to remember that wherever you are, the world is wrong, and. It's probably wrong about you. What's all that? Christmas come early, Mama. Hello, Pete. Hello, Miss Matson. <laughs> There's enough here for an army. And I told little boy to get this fixed last week. Shouldn't spend all your wages on us. Oh, big boy had a big night of poker. Be saving your money towards having a wife, not spending on us. The woman I want me a lot more than poker winnings, Mom. I used to know poker real good. Reckon it's in our blood, Grams. Poker's a bad game. My husband shot a man at poker. Then the man's brother shot him. My Tom. Big boy's granddaddy shot and killed two men and later was shot dead himself. God knows, shooting's been a curse on our family. Stop bragging about all the killing we've done. You give old Pete the impression we're not church people. Uh Oh, come on in. I'll make you boys griddle cakes. Well, no. We got to get on over to Hoover's, Ma. Listen, when little boy gets here, you tell them to fix that railing. Doesn't do a damn thing around this place. Lives here like it's a free boarding house. Love you. This episode is brought to you by Voodoo Ranger. It's beer. It's hoppy, trend-setting, innovative, served with a little sarcasm, just like Paperhouse Network. Paperhouse Network is hoppy? Uh, yeah. It's like 